North Korea. Does any country its size and economic importance get more press? In North Korea. With North Korea. North Korea. Korea. North, North Korea. Korea. North Korea. North Korea. North Korea. I don't think so. From American citizens going to prison and sent home brain dead, to labor camps dotting the countryside, to missile tests, to a black market that often relies on kidnappings and hostages for sustainability. North Korea isn't on most people's bucket lists of places they want to see outside of news headlines. However, it's those headlines, those stories, the mystique of the place that makes it so popular. The infamous Kims may be the poster family for the nation, but it's the real lives of people there living under one of the last Soviet-style dictatorships that is the real, true allure. If your curiosity gets the best of you and you decide to take a state-run tour of the total lie in the North, then you're really just supporting the regime and potentially propping it up and extending its longevity. This popular opinion can be seen in popular figures who have visited and have been allowed to film. Heck, even I've been, on multiple occasions, personally invited to film there, as long as I had a government minder and taken on their itinerary. The justifications for this state-run travel is that at least North Koreans, the normal everyday folk, are at least given a voice, well, more of a picture on the world stage. They're not human bullseyes for opposing nations and political agendas, but actually people. And to some degree, I can agree with this. But what if I told you that North Korea isn't just within its boundaries drawn on the map? No, I'm not talking about the defectors in South Korea. There's plenty of videos on that. I'm talking about the North Korea that no one talks about. The one in China. And this is where my journey begins. The Chinese North Korea resides in the northeastern area of China called Dongbei, particularly around the province of Jilin. Now when our fans told us that this was the area that they were most interested in, we knew it wasn't going to be any easy task, and our stomachs sank more and more as the trip got closer. Thankfully the ride was no easy task, and covering that much distance on motorcycles was a hilariously difficult task in itself and gave us plenty of time to get ready. Hope this handicap does well in the rain. It's miserable. It's really pouring down and it's like disgusting coal roads. We're getting covered in coal. We're gonna try and get all the good equipment in here and hopefully they survive. Dude, it's soaking the mic. I gotta go. Yeah, Bye. okay, cheers. If we were gonna make it to this area, we'd have to ride through rice terraces, ghost towns, treacherous roads, the biggest coal mine in the world, and crash our drone twice in Ford Rivers. But as we ventured into Jilin, the temperature went from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to about 35 and we were not at all prepared for a midsummer's freeze. We certainly were not comfortable. I have a teapot of petrol on the ground here. And uh, what are you doing, Sea Milk? I'm layering up, so I got double vision. Because it's freaking cold. <laughs> it's and freezing. This is hashtag only China things. Yeah. Teapot of fuel on the side of the road. And we've got probably another, I don't know, four hours or something, maybe more, I don't know. And it's getting dark and it's freezing. <laughs> Despite the cold, we managed to end up in a bizarre town of LED bridges and palpable tension as we shivered our way into the hotel. Uh, we finally made it to the hotel and we don't know what to do with the passports. So yeah, we have made it. It was incredibly cold, incredibly unpleasant. Unlit roads, a truck almost rode us over. No joke, it was one of the, the closest calls we've ever had riding in China. Um, and uh, yeah, we're finally at the hotel, but they're having trouble figuring out like what visas are, etc. And I'm trying to look for the visas in our passports, it's frustrating. Unfortunately, this border region with North Korea wasn't too keen on our foreign passports, which is something we've dealt with a lot in China. However, after it was sorted, a personal hot pot warmed our cores, and we were coming back to life. After a fitful night of sleep, however, the reality struck us. So today's the day, dude. Um... It's on the right up here. It was like so cold and so distracting that we couldn't really 
fathom or grasp what we were about to do. Uh, but it's uh, it's getting real right now. Yeah. We're about to set off from the first safe point, we can say. Yeah, yeah. And where, where are we headed? We're going to go to a, a little city called Baishan, which is uh, about 70 kilometers from here. Hmm. Uh, from there, it's a straight shot down north, uh, sorry, south to the North Korea border. And there's a little, little town there that we're going to hopefully be able to get some footage of the border. But, of course... Along the entire border region, right now, tensions are incredibly high. So mm -hmm. they're going to be on the lookout for people with cameras. Spoke to some other people that have actually basically come down here, like proper legitimate journalists who've flown in to just film what's going on. And they've been picked up and basically taken directly to the airport and flown back or put into detention. So, you know, people don't seem to understand is that, you know, to get permits to film in areas like that in China, it's impossible. You d you just don't. You can't. I mean, you, you hide in taxis. If, if you're if you are like some big news organization like BBC or CNN, you could probably, but then you'd have minders with you. You wouldn't get a sh you, you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to shot. shoot anything. So we're basically going down there as tourists. Yeah, so it's going to be incredibly tense. Um, hopefully, we can get in there, get the footage, quickly get out before you know they start calling in. The, the, the cops and stuff because you know like when we were in that ghost town yesterday um we were just there for like 10 minutes you know and all we were doing was filming filming us pulling up the bikes and in that 10 minutes someone had told the pla guys they've gotten in their car and they'd driven over within 10 minutes to come and question us i fed them a story but i don't think they bought it because they came back immediately yeah no they went down the road and then they came back on their phones when and they then chased they chased us, us out. out yeah they followed us so and the point is we're going to go see how korean people in china live right yeah that's what that's what's interesting to us but the fact that we are at the border means that we are going to have people on our ass probably the whole time yeah, we're not out to expose anything. We're not no. here as journalists, news journalists, to say, look, this is North Korea. This is what's going on with military stuff. We're not no. here for that. That's dangerous, you know. We're, we're not... here to see a new part of China. What we're doing is we want to just show people what North and China is like. And this is part of North and China. It's a huge part, the Korean, the yeah, Korean the ethnic group. Korean minorities and stuff. And of course, they live all near the border. Right, of course. If you want to see it properly, you have to go there. Right. <laughs> Wish us luck, guys. We're gonna hit the road. Yeah, for sure. We're about to head into the heart of a region of China that isn't friendly to folk with camera. The Korean diaspora in China near the border with North Korea is notoriously proud of their non-Chinese Koreanness. And journalists in the area have been detained, deported, maybe even worse. We're about to go one step further and head to the area of the border that no one talks about. Vincent, right behind you, there's a dog meat restaurant. You gonna go get a snack? The one that sees absolutely no foreign visitors. And despite us being on the safe Chinese side of the border, we were no stranger to how dangerous it can be to film in China, especially in this region. The area certainly did not feel like China. The buildings, the language, the signs, and the very obvious lack of money and infrastructure. But then you'd hear the familiar diesel trucks chugging up the mountain full of PLA soldiers, hundreds of them piled on the back of trucks as they headed towards the very border that we were headed to. What the heck were they preparing for? Why hadn't we heard about this on the news? Perhaps most interestingly, why were many of the soldiers themselves speaking Korean? Wait, this is China. Of course there was nothing going to be reported here, so we'd only answer our questions if we actually went there ourselves. It is bright and uh, there is a statue behind us. Yes, this is a revolutionary. Um, not going to get into tons of historical details, but basically Chairman Mao uh, banished him here to the city. Yep. And he's kind of a hero amongst the Koreans and the Chinese. And the greatest thing about this right now is not just that, but it's that we are actually standing right now in between North Korea and China. That's right. We're on an island and we're going to walk to the very edge and we're going to show you, well, basically North Korea. Based on the reactions we've gotten from locals thus far, I'd say that we are a, a big rarity around here. Yeah, um, I don't think that you get a lot of foreigners around here. No. We are now walking down next to the river. 
Yeah. I know it looks like a gentle little park here, but it, I, does. it, it looks... feels really weird. Oh, look, finally we have uh, a sign. Oh, it's a Korean in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Guys. <laughs> Yeah, so this this river here divides China and North Korea. What are those people doing up there? Oh, I'm more curious about that boat. Let me see what's on that boat. What kind of a boat is that? Me too. But yeah, it looks beautiful out here, but wow, that is... North Korea on the other side. What are the people doing over there? Can you see it yeah. all on that zoom? Let's zoom in on them. Pyongyang, this was not. Where were the gleaming buildings? The Soviet bloc apartments? We could see people picking grass from across the river as our boots stood in North Korean water. We watched incredibly thin people strip the land bare. The trees had almost all been cut down, and rail-thin men used logs to float down the river, dangerously close to the Chinese side. All the meanwhile, an armed North Korean guard was spazzing out as we set up our cameras. First he took out his gun, then he used his binoculars, then he proceeded to duck and hide when we filmed him. What the hell was this town? Well, it turns out we were in a town called Linjiang, China. And across the river was Chunggang County. Chunggang County hosts much of North Korea's timber industry, and there's also a ballistic missile base with missiles pointed directly at Okinawa, Japan. Not much has been published on the area, but a study found that laborers on the other side, who are lucky enough to manage to do business with China, earn about 32 cents on the low end, and the wealthy North Korean entrepreneurs can pull in as much as $4 per month. Think about that the next time you spend a North Korean month's salary on a Big Mac. The business does get a bit shadier. Signs everywhere are written in both Korean and Chinese and warn that it is illegal to feed or help North Koreans who make it across the river into China. This doesn't stop the Chinese taxi drivers, both male and female, tell stories of smuggling North Korean women to sell men in the poor Chinese countryside, often to Chinese Koreans. One taxi driver traveling with four North Korean girls said, Border guards on both sides, North Korea and China, are in on it, and often help things like cabbage and other vegetables enter the Korean side. Despite this being a very sensitive area, we were mostly left alone, as locals didn't have much time to react to us being foreigners. However, it wasn't long before we attracted a huge crowd of both locals and Chinese tourists from the area. They found us a hell of a lot more interesting than the North Korean poverty across the river. And that was a good sign to get out of there, but we managed to sneak in a lot closer than we should have. From there, we got a glimpse into North Korea that no one talks about. But that was just the beginning. The entire ethnic North Korean population that holds Chinese citizenship was our next target. We explored Changbaishan, which is the historical birthplace of Korea, and half of it lies in China. The snowy landscape in the middle of summer was absolutely bizarre, for sure. But throwing snowballs at each other wasn't going to get us any closer to understanding this region. We'd been warned multiple times to avoid the bustling city of Yenji, 
the capital of the Korean Chinese, despite it being well-traveled and home to exchange students from around the world. This was because of the tensions on the border at the time, so anyone with a camera was definitely going to catch some trouble. That being said, we knew that it would be a great jumping off point to find out more, so we avoided the hotel registry system, the very one that got the two journalists there deported just two weeks earlier, and found the one and only Airbnb in the city. Laying low and staying off the radar, we were mesmerized by the very Korean-looking city and its stark billboards that warned everyone to watch out for North Korean refugees. Our cell phones were even alerted with an SMS as soon as we entered, giving us a convenient hotline to call in case we stumbled across any North Koreans that were on the wrong side of the border. This was in an effort to forcibly deport them back to North Korea, where they can face the death penalty or other punishments. It was in Yenji that we made some spectacular contacts. He knew where we could go to talk to some North Korean Chinese. The muddy dirt roads were surrounded by cannabis plants, and it was jarring to see them grow wildly in a country that punishes its cultivation so severely. Near the border yet again, we found a tiny village where a man employs local ethnically Korean Chinese to ferment soybeans into a paste, where he then distills it into a strong alcohol called dunjiang. The locals in the area spoke Korean and had portraits of the Kims in their houses, right next to the classic Chairman Mao that we see all over China. This weird combination didn't make a lot of sense to us, until our lovely host told us all about the history of this region. This area of China and North Korea, only until recently, had a very porous, almost non-existent border. The Chinese control in the area was loose, and the Korean people had a lot more in common with their identical twins across the border. It was so open that people openly traded between the two countries, and families didn't even use passports to visit and stay in each other's houses, despite the two being completely different countries. He spoke of a time when North Korea was in fact much wealthier than China, due to the support of the Soviet Union. And North Koreans would bring over stoves and dishwashers and other hard-to-get appliances, as well as food, to their families in China. Despite the tables being turned now, the people we met were very much more in line with the North Korean ideals than the Chinese ones, as an old man in the village actually called me an American imperialist dog in Korean. Life may be better on the Chinese side, but only just, as the area is still incredibly poor. The fascinating story of his alcohol production was simple. Despite tensions, all Koreans in South Korea, North Korea, and China can all agree on something. They like to get drunk. According to him, his constant visits and delivery of his homemade soybean booze to North Korea were going to do a lot better than any previous diplomacy tried before. I don't know how much progress he's made thus far, but I can tell you, his drunken diplomacy worked on us. As we sat down and stuffed our faces with homemade kimchi and local North Korean foods and drank teapot after teapot of the stuff. And it was good. The rest of our journey through the area led us to ethnically Korean villages. We met some lovely ladies that taught us the North Korean way to make kimchi. Kimchi. They and many other people in the area were in fact devout Christians, which was another interesting find. There was a point in the trip where we were able to arrange an amazing thing. Perhaps the most brilliant thing we've ever seen filmed with North Korean people. But for their safety, at least at this time, we can't show the footage. All in all, the area was spectacular. Green, cold, hot, ethnically bizarre, and full of real people who all wanted to show us a good time. Remove politics from the area and it's still one of the most fascinating places in China. If things cool down at some point, I'd love to go back. Now this was actually filmed for Conquering Northern China, which is our TV show, me and Serpent ZA did, uh, where we traveled 10,000 kilometers across Northern China trying to find the most amazing and unseen areas of the country. If you haven't checked it out yet, go check it out. It's on Vimeo On Demand slash Conquering Northern China, and you can use a discount code called Lao Winning. Please subscribe if you want to see more content like this, plenty more behind the scenes and normal videos coming up. Please hit the bell button next to the subscribe button, leave a comment and a like if you like the video. Thank you so much, Lawiners, and I'll catch you on the next one.